Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on working towards anti-racism and culturally responsive teaching in open education. Um, on the next slide, I'll try to explain sort of the connection between these. Um, so we have the sort of foundation of what we're working within is discussing open educational resources. So in our previous webinars, we've talked about how to find and create openly licensed teaching materials. Next slide, please. So OER are teaching and learning materials released under an open copyright license, like a Creative Commons license. So they're free for the public to use, adapt, and redistribute. And as part of creating those materials, you'll often hear us talk about relying on fair use, which is a doctrine in copyright law that creates a user's right that permits you to use third-party copyrighted materials in specific circumstances. But having talked about those for the past six weeks, we think it's really important to think about why OER is an important tool for um, equity and social justice, but like all tools, having a new technology tool or a new teaching tool or a new legal tool does not automatically create a social justice benefit unless we think about how to avoid replicating existing inequality, um, existing structural racism, and existing um, practices in the creation of those new teaching materials. So we talk about the benefits of open educational resources to allow tailoring materials to individual students or student populations. We're going to talk about um, how the OER framework can broaden access to authorship and create a more representative and more inclusive pool of people who are authors. Um, how OER has the potential to improve inequality based on cost and how across these purposes, fair use can create um, the ability to address and include existing cultural materials for an accurate and representative view of the world around us. So we think it's really important as we um, encourage people to invest effort in open educational resources that we do th so really conscious of the existing um, world we live in and the structural and um, individual inequalities within that. So on the next slide, it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Hurst. Kelly Hurst is the founder and executive director of Being Black at School and has served in the public education system as a teacher, literary coach, guidance dean, and assistant principal. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us and for um, really beginning sort of our conversation of thinking about what are the sort of structures that are in place that we have to sort of examine and question to work towards equality. Um, thank you, Meredith. I'm pleased to be with you all and to do a little bit of stage setting. Uh, I like that you use the phrase framework because what I'm going to share with you all will just be a framework. Uh, it's a little snippet of the ways in which we can actually do something to rebuild our existing systems of education that are so, so harmful to children who are marginalized in a multiplicity of ways. And um, in thinking about what anti-racism is and what uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what it actually means, and if we're actually going to put the lens of culturally uh, sustaining pedagogy on top of that. So as we are delving into this, how are we going to use this and how will this be a, a fair use issue? I'm gonna offer a couple of tools to think about as you are moving forward. You can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, one of the things that I do is work for Crossroads Anti-Racism Organizing and Training uh, as a facilitator that informs our work at Being Black at School as well. And uh, part of the way that Crossroads looks at this is through the use of a metaphor that um, I will share very briefly with you. This is normally something that would take about 40 minutes to go through. And so I am just viewing everyone in this webinar today as the advanced class who will absolutely pick up on all this information really quickly. And that metaphor uh, comes from the work of Dr. Gloria Anzaldúa, who wrote uh, La Frontera, The Borderlands. And so I have an image here just to be thinking about how this metaphor could be applied, um, that there is definitely um, a center to, to our dominant culture as well as a borderland structure that we've put in place, even if we haven't necessarily recognized it. And in doing that, we also have to bring in historically how we got built up. How did our systems of education 
how did every single system that is existing in the United States that began as an apartheid nation um, <clears throat> in the 1800s, uh, legally, how did these systems get set up and what does that mean for us right now? Not just the harm for people of color and people who are marginalized, but also the harm to whiteness and white people. And, and not being able to see that is actually something that's hidden from us that anti-racism work reveals. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, the question that we often ask is, uh, what, as we are thinking about what dominant culture is, we have a dominant culture in the United States that we don't often get a chance to recognize or even name. So part of the power in doing anti-racism work is being able to name the systems and structures in place that already got set up. So we ask this question in the United States, who is presumed to be normal and standard and good and moral and who are the fully human people? And I want you just to take a moment and I'll give a, I'll give a little moment of silence for you to be thinking about if you were to name those things, what would, what would you be naming for dominant culture? If you would like, you uh, can write them down. These are usually, as, we, as I travel across the United States, when we're talking about dominant culture, the answers we get from this particular question end up being very similar. And so if I were to give you all the, what I would consider the greatest hits of what we hear on a pretty regular basis in answer to this question, who is presumed to be normal, standard, good, and moral, and fully human? The answers that we get are people who are white, or we get people who are cisgender, males, middle class, college educated, and a very specific way to be educated, not with a two-year degree, but a four-year degree, if not more. Uh, that, that dominant culture actually pressures all of us and names itself all of these things to condition us to work for its maintenance which means that if you are going to get a four-year degree from a university, then you also need to get a job. And having one full-time job is considered the way to do it. That's the good way to have a life in the United States. So if you're gonna be normal, you're gonna have a job with benefits that comes with health, that comes with a 401k. Um, it also has to do with people who are healthy, but also thin in dominant culture, thin, uh, tends to be uh, used as a, as a replacement for healthy because we know that there are people who are not thin who are still healthy. But able-bodiedness, being able to speak English without an accent, uh, and even in the United States, we still privilege some accents over others. And that is built into existing technology. Uh, there was a time when Siri on our phones would only come in a British or American accent or Australian. And so what, what happens is dominant culture begins to seep into the ways that we're doing and being and living in the United States. Um, in school systems, when we consider who are the good students, they are the quiet ones, but they speak up when we ask them to. Um, they are reading usually very dominant culture, um, Eurocentric uh, history as well as literature. And um, in, in, in this particular setup, and I wanna be real clear about this, it actually sets up the people in the borderlands to, to try to maintain and to try to access all of those things as well. Because if I wanna be considered normal, then I have to follow the ways in which dominant culture has laid these things out. So you probably have thought of a couple of other things uh, that I haven't named, but those are, those are the greatest hits. Uh, next slide. After we start talking about dominant culture, we start thinking about what the borderlands are and borderland culture. And if you could sort of envision this as the dominant culture is the center and the borderlands are on the outside. And we ask this question in order to get to some sort of an analysis of what this means for us. So in the United States, who is labeled immoral or deviant or uncivilized? Who, are, who do we consider to be criminals and who are the dangerous people? And even in that question, and, and you may have noticed that the questions actually are a little different. The first question asks, who is presumed to be normal, standard, and good? And this one asks, who is labeled? Because the, what our understanding is in analyzing issues of race and racism in the United States is that the center has named itself and the center names the borderlands. So think for just a moment about who would be considered any of these things. You can write a couple of them down. 
And again, it doesn't take a long time to consider this. This is part of how we've been shaped in the United States. It's how we have been socialized and it is how we have been racialized. Uh, so that even when we say, you know, I, I'm not a racist, which we don't find to be a really particularly helpful question, uh, because when we're thinking about racism in the United States, we're thinking about the ways in which legally and economically and socially our systems and our communities have been set up to have a center and a borderlands in all of them, which through COVID-19 has been extremely under a microscope that people can see our systems are not working because we have had this dominant culture for such a long time. So the greatest hits from the borderlands, as it were, usually become like people of color, the LGBTQIA community, people who have a disability or an accent that is not privileged in the United States, the uneducated, uh, the ex-convicts, and then you can start to hear the language. Did you hear how I changed that? I began to use prefixes that were non-ex. Um, and we use, we even think that there are ways that we talk about the borderlands from the dominant cultural perspective that is actually a deficit way of thinking about the borderlands and about the people who live there and are fully human there, but that the center does not see them as such, right? So if you have ever had to uh, write a grant, you know that grant language is extremely borderland culture language, that we are, we're trying to write a grant for the um, underprivileged and those students who are at risk, uh, who are um, in Title I schools, right? Like that language of the way we describe that and how those labels get set on those people is actually a dehumanizing way of talking about people. And we hear that in all kinds of language in the way that we talk about immigrants in this country or um, it, for which I believe, you know, unless you're an, an indigenous Native American, then we're all of us, you know, here uh, on some land that does not belong to us still to this day. And that even the people who, who started in this nation are considered the borderlands who are still fighting for sovereignty and self-determination. Um, so you can kind of see this, this gives you a visual of the center and borderland and what could that possibly mean? And how do we go forward in doing some work where we actually recognize that a borderland and a center uh, culture are actually set up in every single one of our systems. So we can go to the next slide. There are a couple of things that I wanna talk about with the ways in which we talk about equity and how we discuss what, um, what diversity and inclusion and what those things mean. There are a lot of people in the anti-racism space who are much more concerned with issues of equity, which is where open education is gonna come into this conversation because historically we have had lots and lots of biases in this nation uh, and in, the, uh, in this world in which we, are, we have a bias for or against. We usually think about bias as if it's a negative, but we, there is a bias for whiteness in this country, a bias for dominant culture and a bias against everyone else that gets set up and that people who are even in the borderlands, who have a borderland culture, will also try to achieve and try to access those particular things. Because we know that if I can have access to them, I can have all the things I need necessary in order to live. I can have food, I can have healthcare, I can have a home, I can have clothing, I can have education. And so the question that we ask that I would love to pr um, present to you all is when you are doing any of your work, when you ask the question, who's gonna benefit from this particular thing we're about to put in place? And who's gonna be burdened by this thing that we're going to put in place? That with open education, if what we're considering is trying to have an equitable way of doing that work, that if we do it from a dominant cultural centered way of being, we are going to benefit whiteness once again. That, um, that when we think about, and, and when we talk about issues of, of race or racism, a lot of times we discuss how microaggressions against people of color or people who are marginalized end up harming them. And what we don't talk about are what are the macro affirmations that the dominant culture gets on such, with such regularity every single day. You can see yourself, you can walk out the door, you can turn on the television, you can see your culture displayed. You see it in your, in your history books, Right, like I know an awful lot about European and, and, and early American history. I know a lot about that from the white dominant cultural perspective. I don't know a lot about what my black father 
had and and the history and ancestry and everything else that's not that was something that was right an afterthought and so oftentimes when we think about equity we have to do it beforehand this is pre-work that we have to do asking those questions who's going to benefit and who's going to be burdened by this thing that we're actually about to put into place and if you can answer either one of those questions you have to rethink the thing that you are going to do if you can say, hey, we're going to open this up to everyone, and oh, look, we have a, a disproportionate amount of white authors, middle class people, people who are from the dominant culture who are straight and cisgender, then you are going to burden everyone else because now we have an overabundance of that kind of material with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Um, the reason why I, I did this slide very particularly is because diversity and inclusion end up being sort of uh, on a loop. And in school systems especially, um, when we think about diversity, what we think about is how we can actually make the white dominant culture look more colorful. And in people of color communities, diversity is a part of our life anyway. We actually are by um, we have like this, this, this way of, of being by um, cultural where we have to know our own culture out in the borderlands and we, we live and breathe and do all of that work. And we have to know what white dominant culture is about as well. It's why um, I, I, I often use this sort of joke, but it's why I have to know all of your Seinfeld jokes, but you don't have to know my girlfriend's jokes, right? Or you don't have to know the things that are important to me, that represent me, that look like me, they don't have to be a part of your working knowledge in order to function in a system and to have an institution continue to grow, right? So diversity is, is often what we say is diversity is for white culture, right? And inclusion also begins from the perspective that white dominant culture is the one doing the including that we're going to invite you and we're gonna sprinkle on a little bit of diversity so that we actually look better. And not because we actually really want some way or some form of equitable working knowledge of how to live and move through the world because we all have to access all of the same kinds of things. We just don't do it in a way that is equitable. And so when we, when we come across that or when we're thinking about that, um, we look to a lot of research that talks about diversity inclusion um, work that is in almost every single system in the United States right now. And of course, we have to know the history of how it got there. It got there from the 90s because there was a lot of issues with um, sexual harassment and a lot of institutions said, how are we going to protect ourselves from this? Not how we can do better, not how can we actually be equitable, but how can we protect ourselves when things get litigious? And we find ourselves going, oh my goodness, our board of directors are all white, middle and upper class men. Well, in, in, in a lot of ways, looking at equity, what has, been, what has actually been put in place is that we have added women to it. We have added white women to it. And then the other thing, the other piece of research that's super fascinating about how to do this is that then we put people in charge of diversity, equity and inclusion and in terms of the uh, director levels at institutions, and then we make those people people of color. Or we make those people people from the borderlands, and we ask them to fix a system that they didn't break in the first place. We ask them to do some things that are actually harmful to them so that as they're getting into those systems and thinking about that, so what does this look like for students, right? In a school system, and, and in many of the things that I've been attending recently, it is everything to do with how the dominant culture should actually respond and not in a way that is actually equitable. So what students are seeing and what students are experiencing is that we that, that students of color are asked to take and understand all kinds of white dominant culture and, and never to think about their own ways of being or never think about their ways of being as superior, right? So this is where we this is where we get into how this actually misshapes white people and whiteness and that dominant culture. And it shapes them in such a way that makes them believe that all of these things are okay, right? And so teachers then too, uh, and I'll speak for myself as a, as a former teacher, that teachers get into these positions where what we're asked to do is actually uphold white supremacy. We're actually asked to, to be a part of the dominant culture and, and live out the values that the dominant culture has said are the important ones to live out 
Um, there are some, some ways that, that these two places, this, this center and borderlands, that these two places sort of interact. We can go to that next slide. Um, the, the ways in which people have to do some border crossing. So what, what we need to consider in this is that, um, you know, when there is any kind of border and that people of color from the borderlands are actually trying to access dominant white culture, that we can step into there, right? Like I might be a mixed race black woman uh, and so I might have a whole bunch of uh, identities that are either privileged or not privileged there, but I know that I can access dominant culture because I'm educated, right? And I know that I can, I can get actually more education. I got six years of college as opposed to the, to the four. I have a home, right? I, I'm trying to build wealth. Uh, I, I try to eat really healthy, right? All these things that dominant culture says you're supposed to do. And, and what we don't consider is that when we ask people of color, to cross over and access that, that they are going to leave some flesh on that barbed wire. They are not going to come out unscathed. It is, it is dehumanizing for them to have to give up their own ways of being to, in order to experience life as a person in the dominant culture who is able to have a job or able to be in some sort of power, right? Like this is, this is really a, a, what we consider a power analysis. How do we see where power lies, which is why we ask that question. Who's going to be harmed? Who's going to be helped? Who's going to get the benefit? Who's going to get the burden? And so as a, as a framework, if you can continue to ask yourselves that question, as you are looking to do open education, you will do it with an, a lens of equity that won't be recreating the same harmful systems. Because in the relationships between kind of the spaces, um, what we have noticed is that uh, there's a whole lot of distrust there, that people of color and people who are white actually do this thing where what we're doing is constantly analyzing, well, um, we think that those people are unsafe. Uh, we think that that's a dangerous place to be, right? Dominant culture also does this thing where it goes out into the borderlands and uh, finds ways to, to help and fix and save it often. And other things that it does that are harmful that, that may seem like it's totally, it's, it's totally innocent is that they go out there to get experiences. They also extract resources and bring them back, which is where we get cultural appropriation from, right? Being able to take a piece of that culture, bringing it to dominant culture, using it in such a way that says, actually, this is pretty cool. And, and the example I'm always going to use is hair. Uh, and hairstyles and the ways in which, and, and if you're old enough, I'm, I'm gonna totally show my age here. I think about Bo Derek with her, with her braids in the movie 10. Um, and then I also think about black women who are told that they are not allowed to wear braids to work, that it is unprofessional, that there are all kinds of, there's legality to this. There, are, there have been laws put in place where they cannot show up as themselves, which is another way that is dehumanizing to those people of color. Um, it's also, it can be a very dangerous place for people. We're, we're really seeing this again with this highlighted um, issue of COVID. We are seeing all of our institutions and we're seeing that the people who get the most harmed are also currently being most harmed right now. And that if we're going to create a system where everyone gets taken care of medically, um, that actually looks very, very different depending on where you are. Um, Culturally responsive ways of being, um, a, as another reminder, as a, as a frame, as a tool, is to also just be thinking about, is this a deficit view of the way we're looking at people? When culturally responsive teaching is done well, it is done where it looks at the culture of, this, of the child, of the family, of the community, and sees it as an asset and not as a deficit. And so in order to do that, in order to make sure that children get to see themselves, right? White, white children get to see themselves on repeat in school systems. They get to see themselves represented in history, in books. They can open up anything and see their lives. And, and I really just want to, um, to give a shout out to Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who talks about what are the mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors that our students are able to see themselves. Like, what are the things that they do that allow them to say, hey, that's me in that book, or that allow them to, to step outside themselves and look through a window and say, you know, that's not me, but I see another way of being. 
And what are the sliding doors? What are the ways in which we could be culturally responsive and say, I don't know what that's like, but I'm going to step through and get into that world. I'm going to see what that actually looks like. I, I love to use the, the example of um, Star Trek because as a child watching Star Trek and seeing a black woman, on, it made me realize that some of the other things in science fiction were actually showing me an all white future. And it, and it causes me as a person getting shaped by this to ask, am I not in the future? Am I, are, are people who look like me not alive then? And what does that do to our what does that do to our children when they don't get to see themselves as as a part of the future? Um, I want us to look at one last slide as as we're um, as I'm finishing up to just be thinking about the ways in which when we talk about equity and having the four walls of a school system does not mean that we're equitable. Uh, I also use uh, as an example my father who grew up in New Orleans and went to all black schools his entire life and um, did not finish high school because Brown versus Board of Education was being fought. And this is not usually the story we tell. Uh, and so I share it for that very reason, that my grandmother knew that what was going to happen was that we were gonna force, we were gonna force closures of not just our black schools, we had Chinese schools, we had Mexican schools, we had all kinds of people of color schools, and we had white schools, but we did not call them white schools. We just called them schools. And what, that did the after effects of it and how it gets built up again is that we put everyone in the white school system and then we put this burden on the backs of children basically and um, didn't look at how we were actually teaching we just said these are the books that we're, te we're teaching from you're going to learn this particular history so again as a framework as a way of thinking about what does this look like how can we possibly do this work with an equitable lens is to ask who's going to get harmed, who's going to get helped, where the benefit is, where the burden is with every single policy, procedure, or program or practice that we put into place. Oh, that's my, that's my timer. And it was just perfectly timed. So um, I'm happy to stick around, obviously, for questions later. But I, I think that this will get us uh, thinking about what open education resource looks like with an equitable lens. Thank you so much, Kelly. I think that was um, a really invaluable start to what we're talking about today. And I think particularly for people who are coming at this from previous experience in the open educational resources field, there's a lot of value put on this idea that things are adaptable. But as you say, are we fundamentally always assuming that it is being adapted from a sort of normalized white suburban middle class original perspective to the perspective of these different groups who are other. And I think it's really um, important for the OER community if they want to take those social justice benefits seriously to say, well, wait a second, what if things are authored for the experience and the perspective and the benefit of different groups of students specifically in the first instance and not sort of always assuming that that adaptation flows one way. So thank you so much. Um, on the next slide, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Christina Ishmael and Tiffany Fontenot. Um, so Tiffany Fontenot is joining us from the Boston College University, or sorry, Boston College Libraries. Um, she's a head librarian of the Educational Resource Center at Boston College and formerly a third grade teacher. We also have uh, Christina Ishmael, who serves as the senior project manager of the teaching, learning, and tech team at New America. And before joining New America, Christina was a K-12 Open Education Fellow at the United States Department of Education Office of Ed Tech and a classroom teacher in Omaha, Nebraska. Christina, I think you're going to be up first. So talk to us a little bit about sort of the existing sort of state of play thinking about representation in OER. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here. Um, I, I've so been looking forward to this specific topic for a number of weeks, and I'm jotting down notes as Kelly speaks because I always learn from her. Um, but when we first got into open educational, or excuse me, when I first got into open educational resources at the U.S. Department of Education, we were not having these conversations about um, being inclusive and representative or being culturally responsive. We were simply talking about how these materials could be used as the substitution for traditional materials because they were at a lower price point or it was just easier for um, for schools to consider because they were free um, 
it wasn't until uh, a few years ago, now working at New America with my colleague Sabia, who you'll hear from in a, in a few moments, as well as our other colleague, Jenny Muniz, who has written a paper on culturally responsive teaching that we started to kind of broaden the way that we were looking at these resources. And with the Creative Commons license, we have um, some more uh, flexibility as far as what we could do with them. So on the next slide, um, you will see kind of the breakdown that we've been talking about who is in our schools right now. Um, so if we're looking specifically at pre-K-12 public schools, for this current school year, in we have 50.8 million students in public schools. This does not come, uh, this does not count charters and private or independent schools. So this comes from the National Center on Educational Statistics. And we know that the majority of our students are actually students of color. So 27.1 million students. And just like Kelly said, um, white students see themselves in the instruction materials, but we know students of color don't necessarily. Um, and so OER allows us to customize the materials to be more inclusive and representative. And that's something that we have been talking about and definitely have referred to Dr. Rudy and Sims Bishop work on uh, windows, mirrors, and sliding doors um, to talk about changing names and pronouns and identity markers. Um, but we need more. And that's just it. Um, we, we certainly have seen um, the dominant culture being represented of, of people that are curating the resources or even creating the resources. And we need more than that. So um, I'm excited that we are having this conversation and, and bringing this up as something that we need to talk more about. So Tiffany, take it on. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> so hi, everybody. OER's appeal is its contribution to social justice. And I think it's an equalizer in terms of access, adaption, and redistribution. But within this movement where content is key, there are voices that are missing. And although material can be remixed, the OER community should consider galvanizing ways to cultivate our authors who can write with a critical, authentic lens. So critical literacy encourages readers to question or challenge the power relationship that exists in text between authors and readers, and it examines issues of power and promotes reflection, transformative change, and even action. If we can hit the next slide, please, so they can see that, thanks. But within that, Outreach is needed for responsive authors. For example, if we look at commercial literature, a lot of teachers, um, there's used to kill a mockingbird or, um, or the hate you give to talk about justice. And within, just by the point of view of the author, you get two very different perspectives in terms of justice. So when you look at that and you um, translate that into open education resources, the same thing could potentially happen, which is why we need to think about, um, to me, looking at two populations in education um, that OER stakeholders could consider. And if we hit the next slide, you can see that those stakeholders would be um, educators of color and those from historically marginalized communities and pre-service teachers. Um, educators, educators of color because they're largely absent from OER spaces and the diversity in language and experience can give the content an authentic voice and authorship. Pre-service teachers um, because they have the time to create the materials and um, while they're engaged in matriculating and they go into the profession preaching the gospel of OER without having to come in later on in life figuring it out. And at this point, our pre-service teachers are potentially more likely to understand critical literacy and anti-racist curriculum in a different way than previous generations of pre-service teachers like me, for example. I did not get anti-racism curriculum when I was coming through. It's what I knew in my experiences, but not um, embedded within curriculum. So for me, an investment is needed um, to affirm diversity and space within open education resources to, for administrators and education organizations and ed leaders 
um, to invest, to empower these educators, to provide mentorship, and to prioritize, promote, and intentionally recruit um, for OER um, curriculum development within the, pro the profession. Um, what's happening in OER um, reminds me of kind of the OER, I mean, the, own, the hashtag own voices movement, if I can get the last slide, within literature and library land. So what happened a few years ago, they had the hashtag own voices, and it was started to create an awareness of recognizing diverse kids literature and content and um, uh, about uh, diverse characters written by authors from the same group. The same thing should be considered within OER and cultivate those who can create materials with um, content originally written by diverse authors um, to provide the opportunity for critical literacy in learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, I think that's a really important point that this isn't can't address trying to make our OER um, more broadly representative and more authentic about who's represented if we don't also in, in, enlarge and empower a, a different group of authors that we have to think through as we are designing OER programs, making OER grants, what are we doing not only to try to serve different groups of students, but to also acknowledge that we cannot do a complete and effective job at that if we're not also trying to um, bring in and support and I mean pay different authors, right? Like this has to be something where the resources that go into the OER system are aligned with the goal of empowering and supporting authorship. Um, on the last, next slide, I'd like to talk about another sort of cross-cutting piece of thinking about implementing OER with equity in mind, which is um, reflecting off a study that came out of Affordable Learning Georgia uh, about the effect of OER, primarily from a cost standpoint on increasing equity, showing that um, open educational resources implementation increase the outcomes for all students in a college level class, but especially increased outcomes for um, first generation and Pell eligible students, showing that for those students who were hardest hit by the cost of educational materials, that having first day access to free OER disproportionately increased their um, outcomes. And that's a really, um, I think, encouraging statistic but as we think through about, you know, what are we doing to fully realize that benefit, I think uh, referencing back to sort of Kelly's interrogation of how we're thinking about what is normal and what is sort of anticipated in our students' experience, we have to think about not only are the materials themselves free, but what are we doing to deliver them and to engage with our students that re uh, reduces barriers and that meets students where they are. One of the things I think that's being particularly highlighted right now is um, unequal access to devices and internet. Um, we think often about uh, the sort of stereotypical college student as being uh, young and single, but we're hearing about a lot of college students, particularly in um, community colleges who might have a laptop for themselves, but are instead having to use that for their children to complete school, or people who might have relied on um, computers and computer labs having to write papers on phones. So I think also thinking about fully recognizing the benefits of OER to support equity and justice thinks, uh, requires thinking through not only are we addressing all of our students in terms of the content of our materials, but are we also doing so in terms of the delivery. So um, on the next slide, I'd like to introduce my colleague Peter Yazzi. Peter is a uh, professor emeritus at uh, American University Washington College of Law and an uh, expert and a scholar on the fair use doctrine, a user's right in copyright. Peter, thank you for joining us and talking about how fair use is one tool to enable making a representative and inclusive OER. And, and thank you, Meredith, and thanks to all the speakers so far for focusing our attention on 
the fact that for a variety of reasons, this is a moment in which the OER community can very profitably engage in some self-examination around the question of how far they are contributing to the implementation of anti-racist curricula. We've heard just now about the, the high importance that should be attached to bringing a greater diversity of authorship into the OER community. Although Kelly began by cautioning us that, and I think we should remember that cautious, that the work, the job of implementing anti-racist curricula can't be set on or, or placed on the, the shoulders of uh, traditionally excluded people alone. It's our shared responsibility as well. I want to talk just a little bit about another possible impediment. Whoever the, the well-intentioned author of OER curricula and, and supporting materials may be, which comes out of copyright law, which again, those of you who've been listening into some of the webinars in this series have probably heard already as much as you want to about copyright law. But I'll just say that it is you know, a ubiquitous form of information regulation, which correctly, any of us who are involved in writing or making anything recognize as a potential restriction on our freedom of choice. However, and I guess this is a good place for the next slide, there are some safety valves built into copyright law that allow us users, makers in this case, to escape the restrictive regulations that apply generally to the most commercial and exploited kinds of information use. And there, there are a variety of these. Some of them are quite specific. Um, there is a set of exceptions built into copyright law for educational activities. Unfortunately, those specific exceptions are dated and don't have much value in the world in which we now find ourselves, in which both in this emergency and, and beyond, we expect a lot of educational content to be delivered in one way or another online. So instead of looking at those specific exceptions, we look instead at a general exception that is also built into the copyright law. And this is the so-called fair use doctrine which is the slide notes is rooted in all sorts of constitutional values. It's rooted in the, the general constitutional, legal constitutional philosophy behind copyright itself. That is, it should promote the public interest. And it's also rooted, as the courts have made clear, in the free expression values of the First Amendment. This open, flexible, exception of fair use has the great advantage of being the one that can change with the circumstances without the Congress having to reconvene and, and, and modify the law. Courts have a role in making sure that it stays up to date and so do practitioners, so do people who rely on fair use because if we don't exercise our users' rights of fair use, then they are meaningless. And in fact, worse, we run some risk of, of losing them. Now, the nice thing about fair use is that both in terms of its underlying values and in terms of the way that it's been interpreted and applied, it's very, very friendly to educational practice. It's harder to imagine uh, a sweeter spot, so to speak, in the whole range of information practice for the application of fair use than education. Very briefly, if you want to know more about these nuts and bolts, you can really, you can go back to some of the archived earlier webinars. Right now, thanks to a lot of good things that the courts have done, 
in the last 25 years on this topic, fair use analysis, including the kind of analysis that the maker of OER might do alone or in collaboration with others before actually completing their tasks. These days, there are kind of two questions that routinely get asked about whether a particular excerpt or illustration or quotation or other bit of copyrighted material incorporated into new work like a photograph or a musical quotation or a bit of video pulled into an OER is a fair use. And one is, is this use transformative? Is it being used for a new purpose? And the other is whether the amount that's being used is correlated, is justifiable in terms of that purpose. Now let's look at the next slide, which suggests some of the reasons that this matters in the, con in the context of OER. Kelly began today by giving us a lot of wonderful framing and vocabulary, and one of the concepts that she helped explore is the concept of the dominant culture. Well, the dominant culture dominates in a lot of ways. And one of the ways is, of course, that it exercises a great deal of control, even a disproportionate amount of control, over what is expressed in mainstream culture. <clears throat> so there's every reason to think that information resources that exist now and are potentially available to others may be inflected by the viewpoint of the dominant culture. And I want to suggest, and I, I hope the idea doesn't give offense, that, for example, the universe of material that is available to OER makers and others on the basis of a Creative Commons license is likely to express some viewpoint bias, that it is likely to reflect mainstream, or if you prefer, and I do prefer, dominant culture attitudes than it is those of uh, people in the borderlands. Well, what do we do about that? If the general ethic of OER making is one in which only Creative Commons licensed or other open licensed materials are available as illustrations or examples or to incorporate into exercises. That means that by following that precept, we are going, however good our intentions, however Thoroughly, we have incorporated the, the, the goal of creating anti-racist curricula. We're going to fall back into the same old traps and patterns because our examples are going to be examples from a resource dominated by the, the same old uh, folks. And that's where fair use comes in because fair use says, look, you can use anything. You can use any material from any source if you have a good reason for using it and if you use an appropriate amount of it. Obviously, that should improve the question of in, uh, the, that should improve inclusiveness where issues of representation are concerned. But it also enables the discussion, the overt discussion of a wide range of important and sensitive copies, cop, uh, issues of, of specific interest in an anti-racist curriculum, which it may be impossible to get at without being able to quote a news story or e provide, say, an example of endemic racism in YouTube advertising. Take your pick. All of those things are available under fair use none of them are likely to be available in an approach to OER production that limits itself for its resources to CC material. I will stop there.
Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and so I think to discuss specific um, ways and materials that might be included and the ways in which the discovery, curation, and presentation of those materials can reflect um, community experience, we have Delena Sanderson Hunter and Lizeth Ramirez, who work together as librarians and archivists at the UCLA Library Special Collections. Um, at UCLA, Delena works with historians and collectors in the Los Angeles area with specific areas of expertise in Black LGBT communities and Black Los Angeles residents. Prior to joining UCLA, Lizeth um, is also going to talk about her experience as an archivist and reference librarian at the Orange Public Library and History Center in Orange, California, where she managed the local history archive there for 11 years. And thank you both for joining us and for talking about what types of public uh, primary source material uh, authors and educators might look to, to um, improving the quality of the OER they create. Thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, thank you very much. Um, so as um, Meredith said, Lizeth and I are librarian archivists for Los Angeles Communities and Cultures in UCLA Library Special Collections. And we started about the same time, a, um, a, little, over, a little over a year ago. And um, it's a new position, and this is important to the conversations that we're having, I think. Um, it's a new position that is amongst other things intended to um, address some underrepresentation in in um, in archives of marginalized communities. Uh, we don't solely work with marginalized communities. The focus is Los Angeles communities and cultures, and so that means many many things. Um, you know, Los Angeles um, has what is it? What are we, the entertainment capital of the world? We might still be that. Um, so there are many cultures that feed into that. Um, lots of artist cultures, uh, bohemian type cultures, music, all of those things. Um, but our, our, our focus and I think our strength is working with marginalized communities. And so today what we're going to do, and um, I don't have control of the screen, just if you say next slide when you're ready, Bill and will advance them for you. Okay. So what we're going to talk to you today is how to um, understand how structural inequities affect the fair use materials that are um, available for us to use. And we're kind of, um, we're building on the work that um, Tiffany and Peter and Kelly were talking about in thinking about how we're asked to uphold white supremacy in the work that we do in many ways. And so Lizeth is gonna talk a little bit more about that on this slide. Okay, thanks Delena. So um, we will be talking about our collections that we have at UCLA, but we wanted to do so through the lens of anti-racism and centering the needs of underrepresented communities in our work. So we'll be focusing on understanding the structural inequities in fair use materials, including our own. We will be considering perspective, description, access, and use. The first item being used in, as an example is this anti-Japanese laundry handout advertisement. It was created by an organization mobilized against Japanese-owned laundries in San Francisco in about 1908. This is an example of the historic racism that Japanese members of the community faced during this time period. It's relevant even now with the rise in anti-Asian racism as a result of the pandemic that we're suffering. This is also an example of material that includes xenophobic terms by white Americans. The text is meant to appeal to white people and paint non-white people as a threat to be feared. One question that this item brings up to us as librarians is how to describe it in our collections. Do we use the xenophobic term in our collections? And as you can see here, um, right underneath the image, you see the title and we did use um, the original language. Um, do we include explanatory information about why those terms are being included and used in our descriptions? Um, librarians and archivists are generally very into creating access to materials and kind of, you know, being honest and representing um, what that item says. 
but we need to balance that with how such collections can affect members of our communities. And then before moving on to the next slide, I do want to say that most of the materials being used here are items that are available online, so you would be able to use them in educational settings under fair use. Next slide, please. Oh, um, I wanted to say something about the previous slide before we moved on, oh. um, if you don't mind. And um, that is when we, looking at the descriptive terms, they, they're, I don't think there are any descriptive terms applied to it. So you would find, you would have to search Japanese or something or laundry to find this. Um, and so I just, in, in the, the subsequent slides, we're going to talk about what that means for um, educators who are choosing materials. Um, this, this item is not described using the term xenophobic it's 10 or racist, sorry. Um, it's not used, it's, those terms are not used to describe it. And if you guys are familiar with, um, of course now, Safia Noble's work, she talks about um, some of these terms and, and how they're used to describe things. So in the next slide, I'm gonna focus on perspectives. And these are the perspectives of the people who are um, appraising, collecting, describing and preserving and making available for use um, materials that educators use in, um, in educate in their work. And I wanted to make the point that archives and libraries are in the profession are not use neutral. Our systems are all informed by white supremacy and the field is primarily white and in leadership positions, it's still very white and male. So here I wanted to think about how the archivist or librarian chooses descriptive terms in line with her perspective. Um, In-group perspective understands nuances and meanings and usually prefers respectful and empowering terms to describe people, places, and events. An out-group member, out member may be unfamiliar with those terms or may choose derogatory terms or may elide salient aspects of community identity, history, or culture. Likewise, respectability politics might prevent inclusion and naming of, of certain um, subgroups of persons. For example, um, looking at, I work a lot with LGBT of color or thinking about disabled people or um, even thinking about like white Americans talking about class issues or sharing their um, immigration stories maybe from their parents or great grandparents and some of the discrimination and xenophobia they experienced um, before they were I guess maybe assimilated into being white Americans and if you look closely at the image in this this slide it's um it's a woman at um, Centinella Springs and it's called Aqua Head de Centinella and it shows this, this white woman at this park. And the, the, the description says that this woman is um, at the spring, she's enjoying a cool day. And it says that the spring was used by early settlers as a water source. And so in looking at this, there's, there's a number of things that aren't being said. First off, um, Inglewood was conceived as a white city, um, a city for white people. Um, black people weren't allowed to own property there. Also, the spring is on native land. I mean, all of this land, as previously stated, this is all indigenous land. And so early settlers is not a term I would choose to describe um, people who originally used these springs. Um, and you know, as you can see from the background, this doesn't look how I perceive Native people may have used land. And so you can see how um, Native people have been completely erased from, from this image, not only in the image itself, but in the description, um, and some aspects of white culture that excluded African Americans are, all of that is also absent in the description of the photo and understanding the nuance. And so it's important for educators to 
to be able to see not only what is presented, but what is not presented and why when in choosing these materials. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, next we're going to talk about description, um, which kind of is a natural follower to what we talked about before and what Delena was just talking about. Um, so in terms of description, um, libraries use established subject headings so that there is uniformity in how books and collections are described across different library systems and repositories. So um, here we have an example of a Mexican American Student Association pamphlet um, from East LA College. I think it's dated to um, September 1968. So when we describe this item, we can use subject headings like Mexican American, um, Hispanic, and Latino, all of which sound pretty straightforward. Um, but what if members of these communities object to these descriptors? Um, I think most of us are aware that um, there is a growing use of the term Latinx, um, which is felt to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, should we be changing Latino to Latinx to, to be more inclusive of um, the community? Um, that's a consideration that, that we have to um, think about. Um, an example of a case in which um, a subject term was changed was um, of the term illegal alien that was used to describe um, undocumented immigrants. So in 2016, there was a movement um, that the Library of Congress eventually did change the term illegal alien to undocumented immigrant. And that was obviously because illegal Im um, alien um, has negative connotations for those it reported to describe. And so undocumented immigrant was a lot more um, respectful of the communities that it described. Um, another move we have seen in our taking active part in is a change from using um, Japanese internment um, to changing that to the more accurate Japanese incarceration. Um, during World War II, as we all know, Japanese Americans were put in concentration camps on American soil. Um, the government referred to this as Japanese internment. And the word internment kind of suggests that it kind of just happened that nobody was really responsible for it. Whereas Japanese Americans who suffered this incarceration and their descendants prefer the term Japanese incarceration because it is a more accurate description of their experiences. So in this case, we would update descriptions of the collections that focus on Japanese incarceration to have that specific term Japanese incarceration but we would leave the term Japanese internment as it appears in documents within collections themselves. So in other words, we would be respectful of Japanese American communities by updating our records and description of this time period to reflect their preferred terminology. Um, do you wanna add, add something, Delina, before moving yes. on? Yes, I, I wanted to add a small thing, and that is, um, I think earlier, I think it was Peter who said that in accessing materials we we have to realize that some of those materials may have a biased perspective um and so you might have to use terms like um negro if you're looking for black people or uh what is it called yellow peril if you're interested in chinese immigration in the um early part of the last century, goodness, or, um, the, or, or the mid 1800s. And so that may be something that um, educators today may not think about, but that's also a way to engage with the, um, with the biases in, in description and just be able to be aware of it, to be, to be conscious of it. And then look at what, what are you going to get if you put, um, if you use these terms are the, they may not necessarily be depicting anything negative, just, just might be people. Um, so if we can move to the next slide. So here, um, what's this accessibility? So fair use may not consider the rights of the creating community. Archivists use community provenance to describe group creation of records such as oral testimony, of historical events. Likewise, copyright may include access for members of a community who are not affiliated with a university or other repository. For example, some African American newspapers have been made available digitally via proprietary databases that the intended audience of the papers may not have access to. Educators may want to consider how ownership and copyright of intellectual materials affect marginalized communities do not have representation in the decision 
making process. Um, and so I think here it's, it's important to note that um, because of the way copyright is set up, even though th the point has been made that it's set up to protect our first, our, our rights in the constitution. Uh, the constitution was also written in a way to prevent um, non-white men from enjoying their rights. And so there may be cases where because of that, um, the subjects of some of these images may not have access to use them as they, um, as they need to because our concept of ownership and creation only allows for like you know one person it doesn't allow for co-creators it doesn't allow for community creators and there are also maybe a number of people from communities who who are educators but maybe they're not formally qualified or they're not formally affiliated with um, with institutions that have paid these expensive licensing fees. And so in using the materials, it might be useful to think about, to think about that. Um, who's able to use it? Could someone who could read the newspaper 50 years ago, read it today? Um, that, that's an important point. Um, if we move to the next slide, there's also um, a conversation about use. Um, so fair use, uh, yeah, so fair use, fair use laws may mean members of marginalized communities do not have the rights to use materials they co-created or are featured in. Faculty and students who are members of marginalized groups may be a small portion of communities that can employ and disseminate primary, primary source materials in their works. Um, and so I, I, it's, it's important to understand that as well. Um, these materials may be able to be used in a class presentation or a class project, but once that might, for example, if something moves to it from a dissertation to a book, then images may not be able to be used anymore, like once it's published. And so sometimes that can affect how how certain information is disseminated because the because the the rights and the ability to use the materials may change. And that's all I have to say. Next slide. And Lizeth, do you have anything you'd like to add? Actually, yeah, I was going to say, um, I think um, the point that Delano is making about um, um, photographs that are being used maybe in dissertations that eventually become books. Um, a lot of times with this material that you see here that's available online um, from UCLA and from other repositories, you can usually contact them to see if you're able to use that in a publication. Um, it's just a little bit more difficult to get permission for that because of the copyright issue. And sometimes there's fees um, associated, which is why sometimes it's more difficult for uh, communities of color to get access to these images because they might not have the resources they need um, to, to acquire permission to use these items. Okay, so the next slide, please. Okay, so um, as uh, Meredith mentioned at the beginning, um, prior to joining UCLA, I did work at the Orange Public Library and History Center in the city of Orange. Um, and so my work there was very similar to what we're hoping to do at UCLA. Um, obviously, we, we um, collected information, added new materials to the historic archive, but a big part of it was working with the community um, and making sure that our materials were available as broadly as possible. So people could come into the library to look at the historical collection um, because we did have a history center. Um, and then also a lot of our materials was um, placed online. So it was mostly um, photographs, newspapers, and other documents that were easily, um, you know, that they were able to be scanned and made available online. Um, so we just kind of wanted to talk about some of the other locations where you can find primary source materials. Um, obviously many um, universities do have archives. Um, so that's kind of a natural place that people go, but there are a lot of other places that are a little bit more accessible um, for people to, to find such collections. So one is obviously the Orange Public Library where I worked prior um, to joining UCLA, but other libraries like the LA Public Library has a photo collection. Um, so you can actually visit the main library to see their collection, but a lot of it is obviously online as well. Um, same thing for the New York Public Library. I think um, it would be accurate to say that most um, public libraries in large metropolitan areas are likely to have some kind of historic collection that you can access both in the library and online. Um, aside from public libraries, there's other repositories um, 
that will have materials available on site or um, online. So on the right, you'll see um, a list of different types of repositories. So there's churches that have their own collections. So I used the example of Central Texas Conference United Methodist Church. Um, I don't think their collection is available to their own website, but there is a large um, website in Texas that kind of represents a whole lot of different repositories, and so they're included there. Um, there's also a lot of historical societies that will have their own collections. So for example, we have the California Historical Society um, that has a collection that's accessible online. Um, and as well, um, also in California, in San Francisco, there's a GLBT Historical Society that also makes materials available online. You can also check with uh, museums. Um, they often have historical collections. Um, so the example that we're using here is the Japanese American National Museum that's here in LA. Um, they have a wide range of photographs online um, that kind of, you know, show what the community experienced in LA during that time period, um, you know, from early 1900s up to, I don't know, I would say up to like the late 90s. Um, and then there's also different types of organizations that aren't historical. So like the Palo Alto Women's Club will have um, material that's available. Usually it's about their own club, but it's still, you know, useful. Um, then there's other places that you can check, like uh, genealogy society sometimes have collections. Um, and if, um, even if they don't have collections, they're usually pretty good about um, referring you to places that would have access to those materials. So in general, um, I know we kind of, I kind of focused on stuff that's local to LA and California. I did try to look for other locations, um, but I think it's really a good idea um, for any educator or student or anyone looking for historical material to reach out to their local public libraries. Um, even if they don't have collections in your local library, they might be able to refer you to the right place that will have material that will be useful to you. So um, next slide, please. So um, that's the end of our presentation. Um, this is our contact information. So it has Delena and my um, email address. And then we also included um, the website for library special collections at UCLA. So if anybody has questions about anything that we talked about, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, we did have a bibliography. So all the pictures that we included in the presentation um, are linked here. Um, and then there's another page too that has um, links to the uh, repositories that I talked about. So if you want to go to the next slide. Here we go. So it has links to, to some of the other collections that I mentioned that you can access online. Um, and so this will be made available to um, attendees after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lizeth and Delena. I think that's um, so valuable as a way to think about where existing historical resources to tell a more accurate and um, representative story about our history and our current culture exist. And certainly UCLA is probably one of the strongest programs in the nation about investing and in supporting uh, co-curation with local communities. But as Lizeth mentioned, I think there are many um, projects of all size, from small historical societies to big research universities that have materials like this and building those connections between OER authors and educators and librarians and archivists can be really important. Um, so Lizeth, in that question, do you often get outreach from educators or do you end up sort of feeling like there's some silos there? Now we do. Uh, when I worked at the Orange Public Library, um, sometimes you would have um, teachers that would contact us because they're, you know, um, covering certain topics um, that had to do with local history. So they'd reach out to me either for information. Um, aside from teachers, we would also get a lot of um, Boy Scout groups and Girl Scout groups that that was fun. Um, so they come in and they had like a badge that had to do with um, local history, I guess. Um, so we would teach them a little bit about local history. And um, I think teachers in that area in Orange knew about our collection because we would also get a lot of students who I think were like in the third grade who were doing city projects. Um, and so they'd be required to come in, um, learn about the history of the city, um, and then they'd have to pick like a significant person um, locally and then also like a significant place, which I thought was pretty detailed for third grade. Um, but it was kind of a really good opportunity for us to kind of figure out what the best way to present this history um, to the kids would be because you know usually 
um, local history collections are geared towards researchers and adults. So it's kind of nice to kind of find ways in which we could um, work with students and have them find the information interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delena. Um, it was great to see what you guys are working on and certainly UCLA is doing amazing work here. Um, on the next slide, it's um, my pleasure to introduce um, Mark Puente. Mark is the Senior Director of Diversity and Leadership Programs at the Association of Research Libraries. Um, as a clinician, speaker, and facilitator, Mark has presented at regional and national conferences on topics including diversity recruitment, um, racial equity, networking, and residency programs in academic libraries. And I'd ask Mark to join us today. You know, we've heard a lot um, about sort of individual um, teacher level and author level and librarian archivist level initiatives. And I think that, you know, the way to think about doing that work is really important, but I also wanted to ask you, Mark, for your perspective on the ways from an institutional strategy standpoint or a network strategy standpoint, we can sort of intentionally build structures and practices that enable this. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really appreciate having you. Sure, thank you, Meredith. It's been um, really great to hear the other speakers. Um, I've been taking uh, copious amounts of notes here. Um, so uh, as this was framed, I'm going to be approaching this a little bit. Um, actually, I'll start off a little bit from a personal sort of perspective. We could uh, go to the next slide, if you will. Uh, and then also for an institutional, um, from the institutional perspective um, across many different layers. So I think that'll make sense to you in, in a couple of minutes here. Um, but um, so, you know, with respect to uh, the institutional perspective and with my work specifically with the Association of Research Libraries, um, and I certainly don't mean, I'm not going to start by uh, disparaging uh, my, my institution and my employer, uh, but I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, we are often seen, and if you'll excuse the, uh, the tried expression here as that 800 pound gorilla, uh, the big, um, you know, well-resourced, powerful collective of institutions that uh, drive policy that often uh, dominate common agendas within our professional sector. Um, and uh, where some of that is true, there, there's a lot of truth there. Uh, you know, we also have uh, a broad range of, uh, of, and a very diverse group of institutional members and some that are, are you know, really suffering from resource um, scarcity right now. Uh, well, I mean, even before COVID-19, right? Uh, but from a personal perspective, um, I've really been on, on, on quite an interesting journey for me as a sort of diversity, equity, and inclusion you know, practitioner and professional, uh, but specifically within the last three years or so, where I've really taken time uh, to step back and to critically analyze and reflect on my own positioning uh, within these larger, very complex systems that to a great degree have facilitated opportunities for me uh, in spite of my um, working class background in spite of the fact that I was a first generation college student uh, and part of the first Mexican American family. Uh, so reflecting on uh, uh, the last uh, presenters because that was the term that was used in, in, in the 60s, right? But we were the first Mexican American family, uh, non-white family to move into my neighborhood uh, back in the 60s. So um, the, um, the struggle for me, of course, is uh, a question that I have been raising uh, within ARL as an institution uh, to some degree uh, to a point of annoying regularity. <laughs> and that is, you know, how do we as an institution, as a collective of institutions move from not from being not just not racist, <laughs> uh, but from uh, but to being authentically and deliberately anti racist in our orientation. And so uh, that's a, a very tricky question, a very uh, hard question. And so I'm just posing some, some things here. Uh, the image is supposed to reflect the kind of ivory tower, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, you know, so um, as we think about the work and as we think about OER, right, uh, part of this journey is the realization uh, that, that, you know, you all and that certainly I, you know, I mean, thinking specifically about my, again, my own positioning, I, 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 I can't just don the garb of my colonial, you know, uh, Western European, probably Spanish ancestors, right, to sweep in uh, and save the poor unfortunate souls who have not been able to benefit from uh, our alleged meritocracy, right? So, uh, so this is a, you know, a, a, um, these are perspectives that come from a position of accumulated advantage is what I'm trying to say, both at a personal level and an institutional level. Um, so I, I, I don't 
say this to discourage um, you know, this, this type of work or any community of practice from moving forward um, in this work, but simply to encourage all of us to think about the broader systems uh, to which this work is connected. And the fact that your work can serve as an equalizer, but the vital work of this community of practice uh, does not happen in a silo. It is connected to broader social and political systems that were built, most often probably uh, quite deliberately, uh, to disadvantage uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC, and folks from other marginalized and underrepresented populations. So we can make this claim uh, because time and time again, research has shown that racial inequity looks exactly the same across all complex systems, that people of color fall, fall short, uh, far short in any system, even when all other variables are, are equal and have been controlled, right? So socioeconomic uh, economic difference cannot explain uh, the racial inequity, nor can people's culture or behavior explain those inequity. Um, so, you know, we see this work in, 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 in uh, OER, obviously, as not, as not a, a panacea, not as the solution, but uh, we hope uh, part of broader solutions. Uh, it's also connected to power and reward systems, right? These systems that uh, work really hard has been mentioned by our previous speakers uh, to perpetuate themselves. Um, our systems of rewards, for example, our uh, validation in terms of, you know, scientific inquiry, what get, becomes part of our literary, our artistic, our humanistic canon. Uh, so, and, and power continues to advantage those who are better resourced, uh, those who are better staffed, uh, who have more experience perhaps with processes and with acquiring resources, uh, fund foundation grants, for example, people who have the human resources, uh, to pursue those things, the system of public uh, of funding for public uh, K through 12 education, as another example. Um, so all of these are very complex, inter intertwined um, systems related to power uh, and traditional reward systems. The one I, I think shining point, the good the good part about all of this is that there's really no need for us to reinvent the wheel here. We have just volumes of research, vo volumes of writing. Uh, both at, at theoretical and other levels, uh, so that we we know what we need to do. <laughs> uh, we we know what that we need to position ourselves for for sharing power, uh, and for organizations like mine to think about how we relinquish uh, and share power uh, with other institutions and uh, with other entities, with other stakeholders. So uh, we can go ahead to the next slide, if you will. So all of all of this has really been accentuated by all of your previous speakers, our previous speakers, and I, I don't want to say a whole heck a, a, a lot about all of this, but obviously representation matters, right? Not only because it centers the experiences and the cultural expressions of populations who have been left out of the canon, but because what it does, as, uh, especially as uh, I think our first speaker, Kelly, um, emphasized, it helps to humanize these populations that historically have been subject to bias, to stereotyping, to discrimination, and even to more horrific impacts. I uh, applaud our colleagues there at, at UCLA. I was thinking about um, uh, Michelle Caswell, who's on the faculty, uh, the iSchool faculty at UCLA, uh, who took a, a, uh, the intersection of, of feminist uh, theory in the field of journalism and the concept of symbolic annihilation and how the lack of representation uh, in that instance in journalism really leads to greater, to, to greater inequities and even atrocities uh, because of the lack of representation there. As you've heard from the, our previous um, presenters that stated so eloquently, uh, uh, is particularly talking about uh, descriptive practices, agency is really, really paramount. It's critical that we honor the provenance uh, and uh, that we're engaging, i.e. hiring and supporting practitioners that have the cultural responsiveness to know what can and should be open uh, based on cultural norms, based on values. Uh, people who have the cultural proficiency, as I like to uh, reflect upon, uh, a cultural humility to know how things should be described, you know, in descriptive practices, metadata, uh, et cetera. I also like to encourage people to think about the idea of collective action and collective impact. Uh, it's vital that this community, of course, think about its unique role in advancing racial equity, but again, with the understanding that such large intractable problems cannot be solved or even necessarily advanced significantly by one professional sector or, pol or even a political sector, right? But it's by creating a, a collective vision for a desired future uh, 
uh, and for developing concrete strategies collectively for realizing that vision that we can really make some uh, progress. I've shared a little bit already about sharing and relinquishing po po uh, power, what we need to be thinking about both at personal and institutional levels. Um, and also I said, and this is probably incorrect, I shouldn't have said majority cultures. I, I think we all bear responsibility for really doing the work, for diving into uh, these principles, understanding the historical context, understanding the current social and political context uh, that, that, that has helped to create and sustain and perpetuate um, systems of inequity. I just wanna leave you, if we go to the next slide, with a few examples of, of, of things that have been happening at various levels within library and information, uh, you know, both in public libraries, um, um, our, our you know, large university libraries and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and I'll just point you to this, uh, just uh, the Association of University Presses have been collectively working to develop uh, uh, resources and tools uh, that, that focus on that community of practice and in orienting their, their practice around uh, a, uh, through a uh, racial equity lens. And so, uh, so stay tuned for that. There's some resources coming out. Um, I have recently um, been engaged in a cross-sector um, initiative uh, across the American Library Association, the Association of Colleges, uh, College uh, and Resource Li Research Libraries, and the Public Library Association. And we've convened a task force that is building out uh, a framework for cultural proficiencies in racial equity that we think will, will be very useful in, in creating a sort of trajectory uh, across, um, you know, leading to uh, more sustainable uh, and more effective practice in racial equity. Um, as, a, as an institutional example, I, I often refer to the North Carolina State University Libraries that received a campus level grant. Of course, we have to you know, reflect about what, what I just said about power structures <laughs> and about institutions that have the, the, the human and capital resources to go after funding about this sort of thing. But they've recently received this grant and they've sent uh, any, any uh, library employee that has our supervisory responsibilities to an experience called the Racial Equity Institute, which is a series of experiential learning uh, programs out of a, a group uh, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And those of you who may not be familiar with this last example, Project Ready, uh, which is an IMLS uh, uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services grant funded project that was a collaboration across several uh, institutions that created an, uh, an open uh, curriculum and, and training modules, which are really, well done, not that they need my <laughs> imprimatur or anything, but I encourage you to look at Project Ready uh, because they have some really terrific uh, learning, uh, online learning opportunities, uh, particularly built for um, school library media specialists and those engage, engaged in K through 12 education, but I think there's broad uh, applicability. Um, so that, that is all I have to say today. I hope this has been uh, helpful. You can go to the last slide that has my contact. Uh, information and uh, thank you for your time today and uh, I look forward to hearing from the, the remaining uh, speakers and panelists thank you thank you so much mark I think you know for a lot of the people on this call they have some role in designing or implementing OER programs at some scale and thinking through those questions is really important um, next slide please so um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sabia Prescott Sabia is a policy analyst with the Education Policy Program. Um, prior to, sorry, I think I unmuted her video. Um, prior to joining New America, Sabia served as the Media Policy Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Global Communication Studies. And Sabia is going to talk a little bit now and then also preview an upcoming webinar. Thanks, Sabia. Great, thanks Meredith. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sabia, as Meredith mentioned, I work on the teaching, learning, and tech team at New America, uh, where I focus mostly on inclusive teaching and learning, um, and how we can best use ed tech and open licensing as tools in this work. Um, I first want to say thank you to all the speakers here today. Thank you for just taking the time to teach us and to call us into this conversation. Um, the way you've all laid out these ideas and framing is really compelling, um, and I know will be useful for all of us moving forward as we continue Know our own learning processes um, and help guide others in theirs. Um, for me, really one of the most challenging and important pieces of this and where I spend a lot of my time with others is reconciling personal privileges and oppressions while engaging with this work on a professional level. Um, and sort of thinking through the questions that have been brought up today around authorship 
ownership, right, belonging, exclusion, and for whom the systems are sort of designed and for whom they aren't, right? Um, as, we, as we think through these questions and what they mean for our work and for our own consciousness, we're probably also thinking about the students we serve, either literally, physically, virtually right now, <laughs> uh, or the ones that we have in our class, right, or more generally, speaking in terms of, of who's at our school, our libraries, in our communities, not in our communities. Um, and as we know well, lots of, lots of these students are not served by the sort of pedagogical and disciplinary practices that we use, uh, the curricula that we choose, the stories we teach, and so on. Um, not because the system is failing, of course, right, but because it's working exactly as it was designed to. And so when, when we talk about really anything that fits under this umbrella of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're typically thinking about specific groups of students that we're trying to serve better. Um, and, and something that has come up a lot for me in these conversations is for whom exactly inclusive practices, um, you know, who, who exactly are we talking about and who are these practices for? Um, sometimes inclusion is inclusion and equitable practices help serve all students better uh, who currently sort of have needs that are not met at school. And sometimes it takes really specific practices, ideas, language, pedagogies, right, to understand when and where specific groups of students who are not being served, um, when and where they aren't being served, how, and to sort of hone in on the why there. And so as, as Kelly mentioned, right, Gloria Enzaldúa and lots of other feminist scholars, uh, mainly black feminist scholars, of course, most famously Kimberly Crenshaw, have taught us that intersectional lens is really critical to this work uh, in that regard. And since, since no one has just one identity or viewpoint, right, no student, no teacher has just sort of one way of experiencing the world. And when we're talking about students not served by current practices, we're likely talking about students who are not served in multiple ways. Um, this is something I hold on to really tightly in my own work, which focuses primarily on LGBTQ students and involves talking through a lot of these same concepts of identity and equity. Um, and sort of guided by the reality that queer and trans students specifically run through every other demographic of the population. Um, and so thinking about equity and inclusion, what it means to be culturally responsive in this sense, for all students systemically, systematically, and on an individual level is, is a pretty big task. Um, and so as maybe you expected and anticipated from this slide, <laughs> um, this has been a long-winded buildup to tell you that in two weeks, um, we'll be back here to talk about many of these same ideas uh, in this specific context of LGBT inclusion. And so we'll have folks from both pre-K-12 and higher ed to talk about what sort of redesigning systems of learning for LGBTQ students looks like, how anti-racist practices are really fundamental to that work, uh, where open comes in comes into play there, um, what it has got to do with it, um, and then providing through talking through rather some real examples um, of of what that looks like in practice and how we sort of realize that in in the classroom and in communities. Um, so if that interests you, I hope that we'll see you there. Thank you so much, Sabia, and I put the link to register that for that in the chat as well. Um, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work that um, our team at American University in partnership with Will Cross at NC State is doing on um, building up a best practices in fair use for open educational resources. Um, as I think Delena and uh, Lizeth alluded to, you know, fair use can allow you to use many of these materials, but um, without sort of support for understanding how to use fair use and without sort of a framework for understanding and um, sort of normalizing that, it can end up that fair use is something that feels available for people who have more institutional power because they can do that and they're not sort of worried about um, criticism. And so I think a lot of what we need to do is say, how do we make sure that this doctrine of fair use, which legally should provide access for everyone to engage with these existing cultural materials, what are we doing to make that um, understandable and accessible and supported in a way that it doesn't feel um, like it's only available for people with specific institutional support. And so work that we are doing is uh, best practices in fair use that lays out the ways in which uh, fair use is a user's right can allow educators and authors to include existing cultural material, existing third-party content in um, OER, and to understand how that can create high-quality, responsive, and reflexive OER. So we're um, coming to the sort of end of our session here. I wanted to offer the panelists a moment to unmute themselves and to sort of offer any um, final thoughts about 
how to take this, this charge that we've been given to think through the ways in which we have oriented our OER practices, both as the students we imagine serving, the people we recruit as authors, and the programs we fund, and what to do to sort of um, upset that sort of established practice and to sort of reimagine it in a way that might improve, um, you know, what are we doing to improve diversity of authorship? What are we doing to fund programs that serve um, a broader range of students in the first instance? Um, you know, what are we doing to recruit people into teams in a way that doesn't require just relying on volunteer capacity or excess capacity, but paying people for the work they do? Um, and then as we evaluate, you know, grant programs, what are we doing to recruit um, new grantees, to reduce, recruit grantees who don't have the same resources to cost share as large established institutions? Um, so, Lizeth, I've seen that you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to offer a perspective on that? Um, I think, I mean, it's really difficult for some of the smaller institutions to kind of do some of this work. Um, I think one of the ways that I was able to do that kind of work when I was at the um, Orange Public Library was to work with existing organizations that are in the area. They don't have to be specifically, you know, the libraries. Um, and then you can also look for um, grant opportunities for programming that center the community. Um, I know, um, I think the American Library Association has had those in the past where, where they provide funds to libraries, museums, and institutions to do programming, focusing on um, the history of local communities. Um, and so it's really important to look out for. Um, that's all, that's all I have. Thank you. Delena, would you like to add to that? Um, I put it in the in the chat and that's it's just that um, I wonder if educators would consider a workshop to learn how to use primary resources in the classroom and then adopting a critical perspective towards that use I know that there's been some um, some work in archives and libraries about um, about that issue of, of using primary resources and some of the things you run into when using it and it you know, it might be a great idea for, um, I don't know, those, those learning days that, that teachers take sometimes. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that this isn't something that, you know, we have a lot of, if you look at the history of sort of professional development around OER, it's really easy to find uh, professional development about licensing or professional development about document standards or professional development about marking images. But it's just as important, I think, to invest in um, skills that are sort of that focus on what are you doing to improve finding and including, you know, a broader set of materials. What are you doing to really evaluate your your critical perspective there? So moving beyond the sort of technology roots of our professional development to one that focuses on issues of equity and inclusion. Um, I'll take a moment to see if there's any other panelists who have a final comment, but um, if we don't, I'm going to wait for a moment to let people unmute. Uh, I'll remind everybody that these materials will be up on the website that's been in the chat and the Q&A next week. Um, also on the final slide, uh, Bill, and if you could show that, we're going to have uh, uh, one more. Yeah, next week we're doing a deep dive on um, music and fair use. We've gotten a lot of questions about how Fair use can enable you to include music in your uh, teaching materials. And then as Sabia mentioned, the week after that, we're working on um, using open licensing to support LGBTQ inclusive learning. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you for your hard work as educators and librarians. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. Bye.